With the biggest economy and the biggest military, the U.S. has the most leverage to dominate one-on-one -on -one deals with other nations. This power may look even more daunting when President Donald Trump's ambition to make America great again is, quote, all about winning, end quote. And how will this zero-sum strategy impact the global economy? Why are people giving up on the possibility of win-win outcomes? And with the trade tensions continuing to escalate, what's next for China-U.S. relations? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to speak with uh, Jeffrey Garrett, Dean of the Wharton School of Business of the Pennsylvania University. That's our topic. This is a Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. It's my pleasure to be here. Recently, you wrote some articles about the trade war between the United States and China, and the focus of the articles uh, seem to be why President Trump prefers to adopt a win-lose strategy instead of a win-win. Can you brief us on the essence of your articles? Yeah, I, I, I just have actually a, a very simple thought, which is that most of life is about identifying complementarities and then cherishing them and exploiting them. You know, as friends, we're not the same people, but we try to find things that, the similarities that we share and we enhance them. I think that's true on the international stage as well, and it's true in economics. The whole discipline of economics doesn't say that the world is zero sum, it says it's positive sum, win win. And I, I think that's been the approach that the US has taken to the relationship with China really since Richard Nixon first came to China in the early 1970s. Right now, Mr. Trump likes talking about wins. But wins for him means if I win, you must lose, and if you win, I must lose. So the thing that he focuses on is the US-China trade deficit. If you ask economists whether that matters, most of them would say it's, it's really a peripheral issue. But for him, it's a signal that China has been winning at the expense of the United States. Many from the American establishment would take President Trump and his presidency as a joke. Uh, however, he is a symbol powerful, uh, he is a powerful symbol of uh, the new national strategy on national security. Um, but, but the issue is uh, whether he's looking for a deal or a fight. I mean, that makes a sea difference. I'd like to have your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point because even people in the Trump administration would admit that the trade war, war hurts the United States too. So Look at the performance of the New York Stock Exchange market, I mean the plummeting of the shares. So well, what do you think of the prospective fears of the American enterprise? At the moment, it's fine. Unemployment dropped to 3.7, the lowest since 1970s. So are you confident that it's going to continue and be sustainable? Well, the, the U.S. economy, I don't think the U.S. economy is a bubble economy at the moment. I, I think most people, most analysts would say that after 10 years of recovery, starting slower but getting stronger, the problem in the U.S. at the moment is that most assets are quote-unquote too expensive, so there's not a lot of new investment. I think that also means that the stock market is probably a little bit fragile. But the thing that strong economic performance in the U.S. doesn't show you is that average Americans aren't feeling good about their lives. They've been living in a world of flat incomes for a very long time. So you pointed out that very few people in the U.S. are unemployed these days. That's true. But at the same time, no one, not very many people are experiencing increasing incomes. Incomes are flat. The gains in the U.S. economy have been enjoyed by a very small percentage of the population right at the top of the income distribution. And I think that's the, that's the core economic foundation of Mr. Trump's popularity. I wonder if American economists or senior business executives have ever done any Chinese culture studies. Uh, now, uh, Fariz Zakaria, a senior anchor at CNN, did an interview recently with uh, Colin Powell and Madeleine Albright focusing on the China issue. And Colin said, you need to respect China, mm -hmm. citing the case of the surveillance plane in the Hainan Island at the end of last century. And he helped uh, f find a diplomatic solution, uh, and, and that was a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, China 
does not want to be brought to the knees through coercive and confrontational language. And yet, this is what ha what's happening uh, in the White House, in, in, in the D.C. So your solution, your therapy, other than the rhetoric about the win-win, uh, mm -hmm. culturally, China doesn't want to be viewed as uh, being the first to blink. Neither does the United States. Yeah, and, and, and I think that is one of the... Again, you're making a very important point. We have two strong leaders in our two countries right now, and they're leaders of very proud countries. So that is an environment in which frictions could be more intense. But I agree with you that what we need to do is learn from each other. You know, I love being in Beijing. I love being, spending a lot of time in China. Every time I'm here, I learn something new and I genuinely respect so many uh, elements of Chinese culture. I love the way that we get together and we mix business and social over a, over a meal. I think that's fantastic. I love round tables in China. I learn so much from being here. I also know that we in the U.S. benefit enormously from having so many talented Chinese students in our country. You put your finger on the word of a strong leadership. And uh, a couple of years back, people around the world were talking about the APEC blue in mm -hmm. China. Today, it's a new normal. Every passing day of the autumn, you see the crystal blue skies yeah. here in the capital city. So the strong leadership does make a difference yeah. when China has made it a commitment to the climate change pact in Paris. Well, it, we could talk climate change, but the thing that I find truly stunning uh, with respect to the change in environmental conditions in China has been the commitment that you have made to electric vehicles. You know, the, the, the gas, en the turbine engine was the invention of the 20th century in automobiles, right? That's the American century. The 21st century, we're going to get rid of the combustion engine, and that's going to happen first in China. I, I think at next year, there will be more electric vehicles sold in China than in the whole rest of the world put together. That's an innovation economy. That's using the private sector to solve environmental problems. You'd think the U.S. would be in the lead in that, but it's not. Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, now wants to have factories in China because he knows how important the Chinese market will be for, for Tesla going forward. As you said earlier, to be a friend, you need to be honest and give honest advice. Look at the vulnerabilities of the Chinese economy. Of course, we see things differently. We don't see eye to eye with uh, um, uh, all of the things. However, uh, SOE in China comes under fire, and uh, the Trump administration threatens to change the roadmap of China's industrial policies and our uh, uh, 4.0 industrialization in the future. What are your suggestions, realistically, for the Chinese friends to heed? Yeah, so, so I think, again, this is a very important point. The Trump administration is criticizing the Chinese government for its involvement in the economy. What you'd find in the U.S. today is a lot of uh, criticisms of the U.S. for being not involved enough in the U.S. economy, particularly in sort of basic science research and development. If you look over the last 30 years, R&D in the U.S. has gone from being public sector-led to private sector-led, and I think there's a concern now that that means the inventiveness of the U.S. economy is declining. So I don't think it's... I don't think it's particularly appropriate for the U.S. to criticize China on government involvement in the economy when this, is, this has been the story of most countries during almost all of their economic development. And some of the biggest things that have happened in the U.S. have precisely happened because of government involvement. The Internet is obviously the most recent, most important example. So I think rather than saying government uh, involvement in the economy is inherently unfair, we should be looking more for supporting the reforms that will be in China's interest because it is in China's interest over time for consumption to become more important relative to investment. Uh, it's important that the private sector grows relative to the state-owned sector. Those are things that America wants, but they're in China's interest too. Perhaps your criticism of the Trump administration regarding uh, state intervention is a bit controversial. Look at what happened last month. Uh, President Trump signed a defense budget of nearly $700 billion for fiscal year 2017, marking the fourth year of budget increases. And the Trump administration projects the budget to continue at this level well into the future. 
Now that's more than all the rest combined. Yes. 700 billion US dollars. Look at the military industrial complex. China says we will follow the American example by encouraging integration between the military and the civilian uh, industries. The United States says no. The United States said no. You have no right to do that. So military industrial complex was the uh, concept coined by President Eisenhower in the 1970s or 60s? 1950s. 1950s or even right, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, it's the government intervention. It's the mm -hmm. government's planning. So can you elaborate a little bit the role the federal government plays in the United States? Boeing is a successful uh, civilian airline manufacturer, but it also has very large defense contracts which are supported by the U.S. government. The same obviously is true for Airbus in Europe. So the notion that civilian and military, uh, let's just take the aircraft example, civilian and military would be separated in China is just not true in the rest of the world. But I think you, you make the fundamental point, which is that the U.S. just isn't comfortable yet with the fact that China is becoming its peer on so many dimensions. You know, the, I think we need, if, I, if I look at the most important things that have happened in my lifetime, they probably are mobile technology and the rise of China. So we should be celebrating the rise of China because lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty is literally unprecedented in world history. But it comes at a cost, which is now China is not a small, poor, developing country. It's a very large, very successful country that is aspiring to be at the top of global innovation. And, you know, understandably, I think people in China are very proud of that. But it's probably also understandable that, that, that becoming comfortable with that is a challenge in the rest of the world and above all in the United States because for 100 years the United States has been the top dog on every dimension uh, in the world. Are you confident that the U.S. dollars will remain the dominant financial muscles that the United States will flex all the time despite the European concerns? Uh, about the implications of the new Iran nuclear deal and uh, particularly, uh, say, the impact of the recent agreement between the United States and two other neighboring economies, uh, Canada and Mexico, mm -hmm. about the so-called non-market status uh, regarding China in the understatement. And this is viewed by many around the world, not just Chinese and uh, Russians, but Europeans increasingly their concerns on the hegemonic nature of U.S. dollars since perhaps the early 1970s. Yeah, so the, the, the strength of the dollar actually, the U.S. can't mandate that the dollar is the global currency. It's, what, it's how global investors behave. So I th it's still the case that every time there is some crisis in the world economy, money floods back into the dollar. Um, so that shows you that the, that the global economy, the global investors still respect the dollar as a safe asset. Um, whether that's going to continue into the future, I mean, obviously, we, you know, we, we've had the rise of the euro in the past 15 years. I think that's been a positive development, um, certainly for the world, even though it's caused some challenges within Europe. Over time, you would expect the RMB also to become a more global currency. But, of course, that creates challenges for China right now because of concerns, understandable concerns, about capital outflows. So the more the government controls RMB flows because of its concern about capital outflows from China, the less likely it is to become an international currency. But over time, I think the direction of change is clear. The RMB is going to become relatively much more important. Particularly, China has a huge forex reserve of up to well over two trillion, mostly dollar denominated. That shows our confidence about the uh, American uh, dollars and global payment system. Can I just say so something that can about that? can also be used, also be abused by the Trump administration well, to impose uh, yeah. financial sanctions. But, but this is a point that, uh, again, I think is quite profound. You know, Americans have benefited from 10 years of very low interest rates. Certainly part of that was because of the behavior of the U.S. Federal Reserve after the financial crisis. But at least as important has been the fact that, that uh, the Chinese government has been buying dollars. That's kept interest rates low in the U.S. That helped the U.S. economy recover. No one talks about that. Americans are quote unquote worried that China holds a lot of government debt. My concern would be the other one, which is what happens if China started selling all its U.S. debt. This would, have, this would create real problems in the United States. The Trump administration says it will 
restrict seriously the flow of Chinese students. And that has caused a lot of debates online and offline about what that means for the future of the United States soft power. Yeah. What, what would you say, uh, particularly after you have heard uh, Condi Rice said uh, about the, uh, the students, Chinese students, will that seriously undermine the image and reputation of the United States? Yeah, so uh, let me go micro and macro. For the world of universities, there's no doubt that uh, having talented students, the best students, the most talented students from all over the world uh, is incredibly important to America's elite universities. So Condi Rice is at Stanford. I was at Stanford. She was a colleague of mine. Uh, I endorse her observation that we just want the most talented students. But I think uh, going a little bit more macro, uh, Migration into the U.S., particularly skilled migration, has served two incredibly important purposes. One is migrants really have been the innovation engine of the United States. Just look at the number of Chinese and Indian entrepreneurs in Sil Silicon Valley, for example. But the second thing is really about understanding and mutual understanding. And I think having a global student body at our best universities is absolutely critical. Thank you so much. You are watching Dialogue with uh, Professor Jeffrey Garrett, Dean of the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. So the United States, among other economies like you, deserve the credit for collaboration and cooperation, not for confrontation. Yes, the U.S. has made a contribution, and I would add, yes, the U.S. has benefited enormously from China's uh, rising prosperity. But the notion that everything is, that's happened in this country has been because of the U.S., uh, I think, is, is a gross overstatement. What's happening between China and the United States is actually a battle for primacy of political leadership. If, if there's a war, it's an innovation war, not a trade war, I think. Of course, I believe that, that the two sides can both be exploring advanced technology and both both will win from that. Welcome back. The younger generation in China, like what we call the little pinks, mm -hmm. unlike their parents and their parents' parents who went through years of upheavals and misery before 1978 mm -hmm. when China opened itself up. Now, the memories of these young Chinese nationals are very different from their parents. It means automatically. They know the benefits of the communist leadership in China. They don't care about ideology. Yeah. These young people are in the danger of being transformed into anti-American people. Should President Trump go ahead pushing so hard against China, particularly with the recent filibuster speech of uh, Vice President Mike Pence mm -hmm. in Hudson Institute, now that's viewed as a equivalent of the Fulton Iron Curtain speech by Winston Churchill. What do you think of the negative impact of his uh, uh, speech on fire and fury? So the, the, the Vice President's speech obviously uh, was incredibly important one week ago, but let me respond to it in a second. But I just want to underscore something that you said about young Chinese people. For, for people in China who've only experienced the post-1978 period, everything they've experienced has been just incredible, literally incredible. And so for them, it's very hard to understand why anyone would be critical of that. Because the transformation of this country, as I said, is one of the most remarkable things in my lifetime. So I agree with you that, it would, that the pride that young Chinese have in their country is understandable. It would be a terrible thing if that turned into an anti-American sentiment because the U.S. hasn't caused China's prosperity, but the U.S. has certainly been involved in. I mean, America has benefited in, but it's contributed to Chinese prosperity and be a terrible thing to lose that. Looking at um, uh, Vice President Pence's speech last week, he really was saying that it was a critique of 40 years of U.S. foreign policy, um, saying that uh, the, US, the basic U.S. approach to China has been more engagement. Every time we have a challenge, let's become more engaged. And what he and President Trump are saying is that hasn't worked, so we need to be tougher. My view is a little more, uh, I think, a little subtler, which is to say that, yes, there are some things that the U.S. would like to change in China, and I would focus on the things that China wants to change too. The question right now is how do you go about that? 
and Colin Powell, Condi Rice, did the diplomacy quietly, behind closed doors among friends. The Trump administration has chosen to do it very publicly uh, on Twitter, in speeches, and I'm just not sure that that's the right way to, to get change in China. Why? Because there's so much pride in this country. If it looks like we are trying to force you to do something, of course there would be negative reactions to that. I think we should be encouraging you to do things that are in your interests and things that we can support. Yes, indeed, China has benefited enormously from the opening up and the policy of engagement that's been practiced uh, since uh, perhaps uh, the years of uh, Richard Nixon and uh, especially after we normalized the relationship almost exactly uh, uh, 40 years ago during the Carter administration. There's no doubt the external pressure will force China to think seriously, reflect upon our uh, weaknesses and problems. Chinese uh, social and economic progress was going on right under such pressure from uh, within and without. So the United States, among other economies uh, like EU, deserve the credit for collaboration and cooperation, not for confrontation. Having said this, the United States is also proud, allegedly, of redefining and rebuilding China well, <laughs> that, that's a very controversial phrase. I mean, yeah, the Chinese an, would find already, it very difficult to accept. Yeah, and, and in, the, in the vice president's speech, I mean, I, I would understand why uh, Chinese people would focus on that statement because I, I think you said it correctly, which is, yes, the U.S. has made a contribution, and I would add, yes, the U.S. has benefited enormously from pro China's uh, rising prosperity, but the notion that everything has ha that's happened in this country has been because of the U.S., uh, I think is, is a gross overstatement. The, 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 the proximate thing that the Trump administration is concerned about is uh, it's really a, criti a critique of Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton as president, as you know, uh, supported China's entry into WTO. And he supported the separation of uh, uh, human rights from MFN uh, negotiations. Yes, Bill Clinton said, yes, we want to support change in China, but the best way to do that is to create a pathway into WTO. The Trump administration is now saying that WTO in some sense has been a fig leaf. It hasn't changed Chinese behavior. It's just been a way for China to export more to the world. That's the Trump critique. Um, I, I just, I, I don't think that is an appropriate uh, criticism, among other reasons, because the, the, the trade dispute that the U.S. is prosecuting against China now, the U.S. isn't using the WTO. It's using American domestic law, which I think to many people around the world looks hypocritical. You say you want WTO, China, to adhere to WTO rules, but when you're pressuring China, you use your own domestic legislation. That just looks a bit hypocritical. China has allegedly contributes up to 30% to the world economic in recovery and in the year 2017 is higher than 30%. Having said this, what do you think of the future? Uh, do you think it's a, an, a curve of a co-evolution or zero-sum game? Uh, President Trump says openly that unless China gives a list of uh, concessions for a serious deal on the sidelines of the G20 summit, President Trump would refuse to meet with his Chinese counterpart. In fact, Secretary Pompeo was not received. Was, he failed to meet with any senior government officials other than uh, Mr. Yang Jiechi, the top diplomat. President Xi didn't ref, uh, re receive him. So do you think this is the uh, wake-up call for the, the start of a new Cold War? So co new Cold War clearly is the question. And when I think about that, there is one fundamental reason why this is not a new Cold War. It's the incredible integration of the Chinese economy into the global economy. As you said, rightly, China is the most important growth driver in the world today. In the speech you referred to by Condi Rice, she not only spoke about the importance of Chinese students in the US, she also said it was literally unthinkable, and I agree with her, to have a global economy that does not include China. So that's the reason uh, I'm fundamentally still optimistic that, the, that there are some wobbles in the US-China relationship, but the path of more engagement will continue. 
But think about the downside risk. The downside risk is not only damage to the Chinese economy, it's damage to the global economy in addition to the American. And, and, and that kind of, I, that's what makes a continuation of the tensions that we're experiencing right now almost unthinkable to me because I think the economic costs would be just profound, so profound no one can really imagine them. It seems a financial crisis comes in a cycle of uh, every 10 years. Look at what happened in 1997 in Asia and 2008, mm -hmm. the financial meltdown in Wall Street this year. Look at the recent drop in the stock prices uh, in the United States. Do you think we, what we see is the beginning of an emerging financial crisis? What can be done to help prevent? I, I don't, if you were asking me whether we're facing a crisis or a cor correction. I think more a correction. Um, you know, the global recovery has become increasingly strong and it's worked in the US uh, maybe more strongly than in other places. But I don't think there, there's a lot of uh, evidence of bubbles at the moment. So yes, the global economy is, is vulnerable to correction. Why? Because asset prices are very high. So certainly uh, US-China tensions could be a trigger that would lead to that correction. But again, I'm thinking correction, not crisis right now, even though you're right that we have had 10-year cycles for a while. Uh, the announcement of e economic prices for Novo uh, uh, impressed the world uh, with the focus on the use of a new digital technology mm -hmm. and also climate change. Do you think um, uh, digital technology will lead to the primacy of a global leadership and uh, what's happening between China and the United States is actually a battle for primacy of uh, digital leadership? And do you think digital leadership will help pull people out of the uh, world of a flat income? So, so uh, enorm two enormous questions. Um, I, I agree with you that the, the, real, the real battle between China and the US today isn't about trade. It's not about solar panels and soybeans. It's much more about artificial intelligence, robotics, and the future. So it's a, it's, if, if there's a war, it's an innovation war, not a trade war, I think. Um, of course, I believe that, that the two sides can both be exploring advanced technology and both will win from that. Um, the other question is, uh, is advanced technology a panacea for average people living in the Western world? I think that's a profound, that's a profound question. So right now we know that there are a lot of high-tech jobs in the US, maybe about half a million that go unfilled because people don't have the skills for them. So yes, there is a skills shortage. But on the other side, just imagine somebody in Iowa, a 50-year-old man, can we really expect that person to, to go and learn to be a, a coder? Uh, that seems a little bit unrealistic. So, so I think the future of work is a really, really profound issue in the Western world. And you know, I, I think its technology has a bigger impact than globalization, but we don't see technology. So we tend to blame the foreigners. We blame in the US Mexican migrants or, or Chinese factories when the biggest driver of societal change has been technological change. Thank you so much, Jeff. I do appreciate your uh, insightful analysis on the U.S.-China economic and trade relations, as well as comments on uh, constructive competition between the two economies. Thank you so much. Sir. My pleasure.